So I thank you all for coming to what is one of the last talks of the days today. Uh, the talk topic, of course, is uh, about my family's success with my son following Dr. Richard K. Bernstein's regimen. Um, oops, sorry. Yeah, so managing type 1 diabetes is hard work, but great success is possible, and I believe that it's worth the effort. So this presentation shares information about my family's nine-year journey with type 1 diabetes, but it's important that you know that I'm not a medical professional, and this talk is not intended to give personal medical advice. I'd like to thank Jeff and the Children with Diabetes Organization for inviting me to speak today. I feel privileged that I was asked, and I pray that this talk is encouraging and inspiring, and that it benefits you. I have a lot of material to cover, and so I am going to present very quickly. You'll see me skim and possibly skip some slide content, but you may download and review these slides later. And take note that most of these slides recruit, re include links to reference material or to further information. If the technology doesn't fail me, uh, these slides will be posted to my personal website at the bottom of the hour, so lesterhightower.com. If the technology does fail me, I'll post them later tonight. So I'm going to start by introducing myself, my family, and Dr. Richard Bernstein. Then I'll summarize my son's nine years of outcomes with type 1 diabetes. I'm going to talk about the disease state and its prevailing outcomes and the Dr. Bernstein regimen and how my family applies it day to day. I'm going to discuss why we choose to manage diabetes this way. I'm going to demonstrate to you that we are not alone. I'm going to share some recent research that was done on the regimen. I'm going to provide some meal details and some food related tips and tricks and then introduce you to the nonprofit Revere Foundation. So professionally, I'm an information technology leader and I'm trained as a software engineer. I hold a bachelor's degree in economics from Florida State University and my career has focused mainly on technology related to freight transportation. Um, I've been married for 22 years and I'm the father of two children. I am a ardent student and proponent of low carbohydrate eating and of Dr. Bernstein's management regimen and I'm a founding board member of the Revere Foundation which I'll share with you later in the presentation. So this is a photograph of my immediate family taken in November of last year. Standing behind me there is my son Andrew, in front of me is my wife Ellen, and to her left is my 10-year-old daughter Gracie, and Andrew's now 14. So my connection to diabetes is Andrew. Uh, he was diagnosed in uh, mid-2010 at the age of five. It was a few weeks after his fifth birthday. The picture to the right there was taken in November of last year when he was 13 years old. He's now 14 years old. These 14 photographs start at birth and go through November of last year. The top five photographs from birth to four years old were prior to his diabetes diagnosis. The bottom nine photographs were all taken after his diabetes diagnosis. So that can give you an idea of the stages of life that we've walked Andrew through following Dr. Bernstein's regimen with type one diabetes. The top left of this slide is Andrew participating in what is my favorite pastime, which is fishing. The top right is Andrew participating in his favorite sport, which is basketball. Along the bottom, you see things like soccer, flag football, and karate. So on the left of this slide is a photograph of my wife and son taken the morning of his first day of kindergarten. That was about two months after his diabetes diagnosis. And to the right is a photograph I snapped of Andrew and Ellen a couple of weeks ago on a Sunday afternoon after we got home from church. Um, before I leave this slide, I'd like to acknowledge that Ellen and Andrew bear the brunt of the day-to-day -day burden of type 1 diabetes management, and the two of them really deserve most of the credit for the success I'm going to share with you today. So an alternative title for this talk could easily have been the best $20 I've ever spent. So uh, on June 26th, I placed this order from Amazon.com. That was nine days after Andrew's diagnosis and I spent $19.79 on Dr. Richard K. Bernstein's Diabetes Solution. The third edition of that book is what was available back then. Picture to the right is the current and fourth edition of Dr. Bernstein's book. It was published in 2011 and the book is well over 500 pages long. So Dr. Bernstein was born in New York City in 1934. In 1946, at the age of 12, he developed type 1 diabetes. By his 30s, he was suffering from many diabetes complications. In 1969, he obtained an Ames reflectance meter 
that gave him a blood sugar reading in one minute. That device weighed three pounds. It cost him $650. And it was only available to certified physicians and hospitals. But luckily for Dr. Bernstein, his wife was a doctor and she ordered the device for him. He was age 35 then. Within a year, he had refined his insulin and his diet to the point that he had relatively normal blood sugars throughout the day. And after years of chronic fatigue and diabetes complications, he felt healthy and he felt energized. So he wrote a paper that described his technique and he tried to get it published, but no medical journal would accept it, in part because he wasn't a medical doctor. So in 1977, he gave up his day, his day job and became to become a physician. At age 45, he entered the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, and in 1983, he opened his own medical practice near his home in New York. His first book on low-carb diabetes management was published in 1981 while he was still in college. Uh, the first edition of Dr. Bernstein's Diabetes Solution was published in 1997. Dr. Bernstein is now 85 years old. He continues to practice medicine in his Newark clinic. He makes Diabetes University on YouTube videos with some regularity and he conducts free monthly telecasts that I've now listened to personally for over nine years. Dr. Bernstein posted this little infographic back in 2016 on Facebook. It says he's 82 years old, type one diabetic since the age of 12. That he still practices medicine, working 40 hours or more per week on his feet. That he performs high intensity interval training. And that he believes that diabetics have a right to normal blood sugars. And that you can too. At, at age 85, Dr. Bernstein's been achieving that for 50 years. So the motivational speaker, Tony Robbins, says if you want to be successful, find a person who's achieved the results you want, copy what they do, and you'll achieve the same results. Dr. Bernstein says every person with diabetes is entitled to the same blood sugars as a person without diabetes. And he says he's eaten a low carb diet and had those normal blood sugars for many decades and that you can do it too. In July of 2012, my wife and I chose to follow Dr. Bernstein with our then five-year-old son. And Diabetes Solution quickly became the best $20 I've ever spent. And that's why. Sir Andrew was diagnosed with an A1C of 10.6. We almost immediately moved him to Dr. Bernstein's Diabetes Solution Regiment. And what you see there is nine years of A1C is right around the 5% mark. For what I just showed you, my deepest and most heartfelt emotion is gratitude. I feel blessed beyond all measure that this story is my family story. And I'm excited to share more information with you about our nine year journey. But to properly tell that story, I need to summarize the type one diabetes disease state and talk about prevailing outcomes. So type one diabetes is an autoimmune disease. It destroys the body's ability to produce insulin which is a vital hormone for blood sugar control. Severely elevated blood sugar is a hallmark of the disease and synthetic insulin must be supplied to sustain life. Healthy bodies tightly regulate blood sugar within a narrow range. Healthy bodies can rapidly place insulin directly into the portal vein. Subcutaneously injected or infused insulin is a poor substitute for that. Poor blood sugar control leads to dire health consequences. So excellent control is highly desirable, but insulin is a powerful drug and the body blindly responds to its commands and that leads to difficulties. So hemoglobin, A hemoglobin A1C is a common blood test used to diagnose and then gauge how well diabetes is being managed. An A1C result reflects an average blood sugar for the last two to three months and higher A1C levels indicate wor worse blood sugar control and therefore an increased risk of developing diabetes complications. Non-diabetic A1C levels are about 5%. This chart was taken from a diabetes care article published about 10 years ago. I highlighted with a red line the peak of the cohort of study participants who had a normal fasting blood glucose. And you can see that that A1C is just a smidge over 5%. I copy pasted this directly from the American Diabetes Association's website about why A1C matters. High glucose levels cause complications in people with diabetes. Keeping glucose levels as low as possible prevents or slows some complications. The often talked about diabetes control and complications trial had half 
of the people stay on standard treatment while the other half followed an intensive control program. And the findings for intensive control versus standard treatment was that diabetic eye disease started in only one quarter as many people, kidney disease started in half as many people, nerve disease started in one third as many people, and far fewer people who already had early forms of these complications got worse. This article was published in February of this year in Diabetes Technology and Therapeutics. The article is entitled State of Type 1 Diabetes Management and Outcomes. I've actually seen this article discussed in several other talks uh, the last few days that I've, I've been involved in, or that I've, I've witnessed, sorry. Um, the average A1C across all age groups in the newest and uh, most recent studied group was 7.8%. Noteworthy to me is about half of those participants were overweight or obese. There's a couple of things that really strike me about this study. So first of all, there's a lot of participants, almost 23,000. And they studied these same patients over two time periods. The earliest time period was 2010 to 2012, which is graphed in orange there. The most recent time period, which was six years later, was 2016 to 2018, graphed in blue. And you can see the A1C results, our prevailing outcomes as a community have gotten worse. And they've gotten markedly worse in children, adolescents, teenagers, and young adults, as shown by the blue spike in that graph. And technology is not improving prevailing outcomes. All three of these graphs come from that same paper. So at the same time that our outcomes are getting worse, CGM usage has skyrocketed. Insulin pump usage has also gone up impressively. Here's my son's nine years of glycemic control compared to those prevailing outcomes. To help you visualize that, I drew in two vertical lines, one at age five and one at age 14. Those are the nine years we've walked Andrew through with diabetes. In the start, his peer group was achieving an average A1C of just over 8%, probably an 8.1% is what that looks like. In the most recent studied time period, his 14-year-old age group is achieving an A1C deep into the 9%, probably 9.2 is what it looks like to me. On the left there are all of Andrew's A1C's graphs starting five months after diagnosis through his most recent A1C. If you average all 30 of those tests, his nine-year average is 4.96%. So this chart is based on a couple of math formulas that came out of the Diabetes Control and Complications trial. This chart correlates A1C to average blood sugars over the last two or three months. I've added to this chart, circled in yellow, the prevailing outcomes that I just showed you, ranging between seven and a half and nine and a half. Now I've added the outcomes from the Diabetes Control and Complications trial, where the intensive control group achieved an A1C around seven, and the standard care group achieved an A1C around nine. And these are the outcomes of my son for the last nine years. His lowest A1C has been 4.6. The highest he's ever had was 5.4. Most of them are much closer to a 5.8 range, excuse me, a 5.0, ranging between about 4.8 and 5.2. So here's what I'd like you, to take, like you to take away from all of that. Prevailing outcomes are simply not good. And recent studies show that outcomes are getting worse, but vastly better outcomes are possible. So now I'm going to summarize Dr. Bernstein's diabetes management regimen. I'm going to talk about how my family applies it day to day. So this slide is my best attempt to boil over 500 pages of the Bible of successful diabetes management down to one slide. That is a hard task. So I'm gonna start with this concept called the laws of small numbers. It's actually the title to chapter seven of Dr. Bernstein's book. The first sentence of that chapter is big inputs make big mistakes and small inputs make small mistakes. Small inputs and small mistakes are the seminal cornerstone concept of Dr. Bernstein's regimen with specific relation to blood glucose. We pursue long and shallow hills. We work hard to avoid short and steep peaks. The CGM graph that you see at the bottom left there shows two time periods. The top graph is the past three hours. The bottom graph is the last 48 hours or two days. This is the graph of a diabetic that follows Dr. Bernstein's regimen. And you can see this person is very successfully achieving long and shallow hills and avoiding short and steep peaks. The way we accomplish that, the three main tenets that I pulled out of the book and put on this slide 
are a low carb, high protein diet, properly using insulins, and precisely correcting low blood sugars. I'm gonna walk through each of those three main tenets one at a time, starting with the low carb, high protein diet. But I decided to start this part of my presentation by addressing an elephant that should be in the room, and that is that carbohydrate is not an essential, mac an essential macronutrient. Dr. Richard Lundquist says it this way. He says, we have essential amino acids. We must eat protein or we're gonna die. We have fatty acids that are essential. We must eat fats or we're gonna die. But there is no such thing as an essential carbohydrate. Now, if the information on this slide surprises you, this should surprise you even more because the Institute of Medicine of the National Academies in their 1,332 page dietary reference intakes manual in chapter six, which covers dietary carbohydrate, states the lower limit of dietary carbohydrate compatible with life apparently is zero, provided that adequate amounts of protein and fat are consumed. Diets do not need carbohydrate, no matter what you've been told. But it is true that the cells of the body need glucose. But it's also true that several human metabolic processes make glucose. Two of them, not all of them, but two of them are gluconeogenesis, which makes glucose from non-carbohydrate substrates, including amino acids from protein foods, and glycogenolysis, which makes glucose from glycogen. I'd like you to, to talk about and have you think about just for a minute how much glucose is normally in a person's entire bloodstream. So the average adult has between four and a half and five and a half liters of blood. So from there, the math is pretty easy. At a glucose concentration of 83 milligrams per deciliter in five liters of blood, which is 50 deciliters, 4.2 grams or one teaspoon. That's the amount of glucose flowing through my veins as I'm standing here talking to you. See, it's easy to find pictures like the one on the top left there uh, correlating uh, high fructose corn syrup or sugar sweetened beverages to teaspoons of sugar. It's less common to see that correlation to something like a banana. So diced up in that little glass serving dish is a half of a medium banana. It's four and a half teaspoons of sugar or four and a half times what's in my entire bloodstream. So I don't have time to walk through this table, but to the, to the right there is a, a list of foods and it relates their sugar content to that whole body normal glucose level. I'll mention that above the red line are foods that my son never consumes. Neither do I, by the way. Uh, below the red line are foods that my son consumes with regularity. So this food, food pyramid uh, is a good demonstration of how our low carb and high protein diet is constructed. Our diet is acred in meats, eggs, and dairy. We add to that green leafy vegetables a smaller amount of non-green vegetables, an even smaller amount of nuts and seeds, and a fairly minuscule amount of mostly berries as fruit, things like strawberry, raspberries, blueberries, and others. Our goal is to provide my son with excellent nutrition while avoiding rapid increases in blood sugar. To do that, we completely exclude foods like those on the bottom left, bread, pasta, sugar, milk, corn, beans, rice. With regards to fat, we do not fear fat, but we do not push fat, nor do we chase ketosis in my son. My son eats a low carb, high protein diet, not a low carb, low protein, high fat diet. That's an important distinction. We're gonna talk about it some more. For my family, fat is really just along for the ride. We don't fear it, but it comes along with our protein foods. So in practice on a daily basis, uh, this is what Andrew's carbohydrate and protein intake looks like. To get to these numbers, I grabbed two random days in November of last year and just averaged them. Uh, he ate 30 grams of carbohydrate, average across these two days, and 258 grams of protein. To accomplish that, he ate foods for breakfast, lunch, and dinner that looked very much like the photographs that I put on this slide. Growing kids need a lot of protein. By definition, they are bodybuilding. Bodybuilding requires protein. These three photographs are of Andrew through uh, a three years time. Uh, the one on the left was taken when he was 10 years old in November of 2015. 
and one of the middles almost exactly one year later. You can see he grew from below my collarbone to up over my shoulder. The one to the right is two years later, and you can see how much he grew. To try to give you a quantitative idea of how rapidly a teen boy grows, um, we recently changed endocrinologists. Um, the, the one that we have been with for several years moved to Tampa, and we had to change. Because of that doctor change, we had endocrinology visits that were just 65 days apart. In those 65 days, Andrew grew two centimeters, which is eight tenths of an inch. Growing kids need protein. How much protein? Well, really, we just let Andrew's hunger guide his protein consumption. He knows he can always ask us to adjust his protein portions up or down. He does that as he desires. Uh, in recent months, as an example, he's moved his evening meat portion from as low as eight ounces to as high as 11, and he does that in accordance with his activity and his hunger. Dr. Bernstein has daily recommendations. He recommends a minimum of 1.2 grams per kilogram of body weight for sedentary adults, and then two to five times that amount for active growing children. So next I'm gonna talk about properly using insulins, which is about using the correct insulins, and then properly dosing and timing them. But to talk about insulins, we have to talk about food for a couple of more slides. So the graph on the left here is one that I drew that shows relative blood glucose impacts of the three main macronutrients that are in food, carbohydrate, protein, and fat. It's easy to Google graphs like this on the internet. Recall that in our diet, carbohydrate has a limit, protein has a goal, and fat's just along for the ride. Notice that carbohydrate has the most immediate highest impact, shortest term impact on blood sugar. But we limit carbohydrate to a quite small amount. Protein has a very noticeable, a very real impact on blood sugar, but it's much less intense. It's spread over many more hours. And by limiting carbohydrate and having a goal for protein, that's how we achieve the food side of long and shallow hills. On the insulin side, we use different insulins. So graphed to the farthest of the left in the insulin graph are the rapid acting insulins. You'll recognize brand names like Humalog, Novolog, and Apidra. Just to the right of those, graphed in solid purple, is regular human insulin. Brand names are Humalin R from Eli Lilly and Novolin R from Novo Nordisk. We dose most of my son's meals exclusively with Novolin R. And you can see now the action profile of that insulin, regular human insulin, not modified by science to be sped up or slowed down, much better matches an action profile of a low-carb, high-protein diet. It's almost set it and forget it. Dr. Bernstein pushed uh, this infographic out on Facebook a couple years ago. He talked about a common mistake that's made when people talk about trying to do a low-carb diet and failing. It's really the same concept I described on the last slide, but, a little, but presented a little differently. So the left here is a graph of the blood sugar impact of a low-carb meal on the top in blue. Below that, graphed in white, is the action profile of Humulin R, Eli Lilly's regular insulin. And graphed in red is the resultant blood sugar, which is relatively flat. That's our goal. To the right is an example of a person changing to a low-carb, high-protein meal, but not changing their insulin and continuing to try to use an ultra-rapid. And what you see is you have far too much insulin action in the first hour or two of the meal, and you can have low blood sugar. In fact, you could have somewhat severe low blood sugar that you're then forced to correct. And as the protein of the meal continues to digest and raise blood sugar, that ultra-rapid acting insulin wears off and you don't have enough insulin action and they have a lot of high blood sugar later. It's very important to know Dr. Bernstein's regimen is not just about low carb, it's about learning how to properly use insulin to match the action profiles of that different meal plan. And the last thing I'd like to talk about is precisely correcting low blood sugars, using measured amounts of pure glucose, and being careful not to overcorrect. So it's important to know that glucose does not need to be digested or converted by the liver into anything else. Therefore, we exclusively use measured amounts of pure glucose to raise Andrew's blood sugar rapidly and precisely. In the bottom left there are pictured examples of what we commonly use to raise Andrew's blood sugar. The Smart, the USA Smarty Candy is very convenient. It comes in three sizes, the smallest of which 
is four tenths of a gram of glucose per little candy. The giant is one gram and the mega is three grams. When Andrew was much younger and much smaller, the four tenths of a gram Smarty was appropriate. As Andrew aged and grew, the giant Smarty at one gram was appropriate. Now at 14 years old and nearly six feet tall, he most often uses the mega because three grams is a, is a reasonable dose for him. Overnight, and sometimes during sporting events, we prefer to use liquid glucose. I've pictured a common brand there. You can buy this type of liquid glucose at any drugstore. We measure that liquid glucose out by the teaspoon. And each teaspoon of these commonly sold glucose liquids are 1.25 grams of pure glucose per teaspoon of liquid, or five mils, five milliliters. Uh, the table to the right of this slide is taken from chapter 20 of Dr. Bernstein's book. It gives you a good starting point for how much one gram of glucose should raise blood sugar. I circled where my son falls on this chart because I want to demonstrate that individuals vary. This chart would tell you that my son, uh, his blood sugar should be raised between four and a half and five points by one gram of glucose. In actuality, Andrew's blood sugar is, ri is risen more like seven or seven and a half points per gram of glucose. So individual results will vary. You do have to experiment and find out what, what that factor is for you or your child, but this is a great starting point. So I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking about my family's day-to-day -day application of Dr. Bernstein's regimen. I'm gonna start by presenting to you our day-to-day -day diabetes management tools. So on the top left, you see two books pictured. One is a relatively large three ring binder uh, it stays permanently sitting on a kitchen counter in my home. You also see a small orange log book. That little log book allows Andrew to record blood sugar readings and insulin doses, and he carries that book with him all the time to help him inform his insulin dosing decisions. Um, to the far right of the slide is a scan of one of the uh, pages from that three ring binder. Uh, the diabetes management diary uh, is how it's titled. You can see on that page that we record things like blood sugar readings, the foods that Andrew ate, the macronutrient content of those foods. Uh, we record things like activity. So for example, on this day, you can see he had basketball practice from three to 6 p.m. Uh, I also can see in the middle of that page there that during basketball practice, he ate two sweet tarts, which means in three hours, he had two grams of glucose to raise blood sugar. Um, and if you're curious about what smudged out, uh, it's insulin. Uh, so we also record insulin doses there, but I did not want to be giving personal medical advice, so I smudged out the insulin dosing. Uh, to the right of the, the two books that I just showed is Andrew's blood sugar meter. Uh, you can see the three Novo Nordisk insulins that we use every day, and then you can see the uh, standard insulin syringes and the two forms of glucose that I spoke about on an earlier slide. Uh, I think it goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway. Uh, advanced technology does not underline my son's diabetes management success. So we employ a continuous improvement mindset. My advice to you is to record everything, especially in the beginning. I showed you on the last slide the types of things that we record. We reflect on that data. We combine it with an understanding of the action times of insulin to beneficially adjust our regimen day to day. Beneficial adjustments take many forms. They most often involve raising or lowering insulin doses or moving their times backwards or forwards. Beneficial adjustments require reliable data. So you gotta get off the blood sugar roller coaster because then you can observe details that you can't see when blood sugars are in constant flux. And being able to observe and react to those details is what allows one to hone their personal regimen. I wanna take a minute to make it clear that I'm not anti-technology. I think diabetes technology is great, but it alone cannot provide near to normal blood sugars. And even if it achieves that someday, cost will keep it out of the reach of most of the world's insulin dependent population, and that actually matters to me. My son is also proof that technologies like CGM and insulin pumps are not required to achieve great success. Andrew's never used either, not even for a single day. Despite Andrew not using a CGM, I highly recommend their use, and so does Dr. Bernstein. And in fact, he insists on CGM use for all of his pediatric patients and for adults who live alone. I know many successful insulin pumpers, but Dr. Bernstein cautions against using insulin pumps. He does that primarily because of scar tissue, 
that can occur in infusion sites and degrade insulin absorption. Lastly, I feel strongly that people deserve medical liberty, and I fear a future where only ultra-rapid acting insulins are made available, and they're intended only for use in infusion pumps, perhaps automated infusion pumps. So my family's in this together. We all eat the exact same low carbon, high protein diet and we have for nine years. In the beginning, we absolutely did it only for my young son's sake. And that's strong motivation, by the way. Um, but we all benefited. Ellen and I both rapidly lost body weight and we regained health that we had lost. We're now both in our mid forties and we both weigh what we did in college. The picture to the left there was taken December of 2009 and the one in the middle was December of 2010. Those pictures are interesting because one was almost exactly six months before Andrew's diabetes diagnosis. One was almost exactly six months after. The difference in me between those two pictures is about 40 pounds. And to the right there, the picture from November of last year is nine years later and that 40 pounds is still gone. This is a lifestyle for us. This is a healthy way of eating. I do not consider this a diet. So Dr. Bernstein says if you're trying to convince a type 1 child to eat low carb, the whole family has to do it, otherwise you're making it hopeless. I'm not sure if that's true in every instance, but in general terms, he's probably right. So now I'd like to talk about why we choose to manage type 1 diabetes this way, and I think about three tenets, safety, quality of life, and there really is no deprivation, so for me the choice is easy, why not? So in terms of short-term safety, High carb foods require very large doses of the most potent insulins man has made. It's impossible to dependably match those high carb foods and those ultra rapid acting insulins. You may do it from time to time, you may get lucky, you don't do it day in and day out. Instead, my son has slower lows and lower highs and those are much safer. In terms of long term safety, Dr. Bernstein's dehydrating illness protocol leads to dramatically fewer diabetes-related hospitalizations. The research is clear. Typical rates are very high. And in nine years, my son has never been to a doctor or a hospital, even in times of illness, for anything related to diabetes. And of course, the commonly occurring long-term complications come from chronically abnormally high blood sugars, and we just completely avoid those. In terms of quality of life, my family has far less fear of diabetes due to the enhanced safety that I just walked you through. My son having slower lows and lower highs means that diabetes commands less constant attention. And becoming the captain of your own ship through the mastery of diabetes management is hugely rewarding. And there truly is no deprivation. While it is true that my family predominantly eats foods only from the outer perimeters of a grocery store, we eat phenomenally well. The two pictures on the bottom right there were taken on Andrew's 14th birthday. The plate of food is a very large cheeseburger uh, made on a low carb smart bun, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later in a, in a later slide. To the right is uh, coleslaw and to the back of that plate is zucchini fries, a low carb substitute for french fries. And to the bottom right there is the newly minted 14 year old, give me a thumbs up while he eats that plate of food. By the way, hamburgers are Andrew's favorite food in the world, which is why he was served this on his 14th birthday. For us, we gladly trade highly processed convenience foods for the enhanced safety and quality of life that I just described to you. Here's a real example of why I like managing diabetes this way. This interaction between my son and me happened to occur on May 1st during a conference call with Jeff Hitchcock in which we were discussing me speaking here today. I just told you, Andrew loves grilled hamburgers, his favorite food in the world, but is, at his school's cookout, only hot dogs remained. Two and a half hours later, or two hours later, he took a postprandial blood sugar and it was high, and he texted me. And he said, so at the cookout, the people ran out of food, right? So they ended up only having hot dogs for people, so I had to eat those. My blood sugar was just 180, and I gave myself two units. Do you think that was fine? Regarding that Novolog dose, yeah was my simple reply. He texted back okay, and I said, really sorry that they didn't have hamburgers, bub. So what I like about this interaction with my son is my reply was dominated by sympathy that he missed out on hamburgers that I know that he loves so much, 
had very little to do with his blood sugar correction. And just to finish telling the story, I went back and looked at our logs, and two and a half hours later, when he next, next took his blood sugar, it was 92 milligrams per deciliter. So sometimes I'm asked, what if Andrew hates you? What if you were Bell's? My responses are pretty simple. The diabetes control and complications trial showed benefits from tight glucose control even decades after that study ended. If Andrew rebels, he wasn't harmed on my watch. And he'll leave our care knowing the consequences of poor blood sugar control and how to avoid them. I really just view this as parenting with higher stakes, at least where his physical well-being is concerned. I also have faith in Proverbs 22.6. And I think the best parenting is honest and it leads by example. And that's really what we try to do. And we are not alone. So this is an aged eight boy in St. Louis, Missouri. His mom provided me this journey chart. Uh, Samuel was diagnosed at 13 months old in 2011, and this journey chart shows their journey from standard care into sort of fiddling with Dr. Bernstein's diabetes solution, which is the time period in yellow, to really buckling down and committing, which is shown uh, after the green line. And Samuel now has over four years of A1Cs between four and a half and five percent. This is a 10-year-old boy in Melbourne, Australia. His dad also provided me a journey chart. The first year of their five years, they were under standard care. You can see the dividing line there. The last four years, they followed Dr. Bernstein's regimen. That is a string of A1Cs right around five percent. I do not have time to go through it. There's a table at the bottom this father provided me which shows other outcomes before and after. It's a great list. You should look at it. This is slide 63. Grab my deck later and have a look. Uh, this is Emily, a 10-year-old girl in Jacksonville, Florida. I happen to know Emily and her family quite well because her family attends the same church that I do. So I see her on most Sundays. She was diagnosed at age 5 with an A1C of 13.3. They began Dr. Bernstein's regimen four months later. She's now 10 with a string of A1Cs for about four and a half years, right around 5%. Uh, this is Gordon, a recent college graduate. He was diagnosed his senior year of high school in December of 2014 with an A1C of 11.4. He started the Bernstein Regiment in May of 15, and you can see he accomplished four years of A1Cs, right around 5%. And he did this in college, not just any college. He recently graduated from Princeton. This is so impressive to me. This is slide 66. You can grab my deck after the talk. It has hours and hours and hours of video of other folks giving testimonials like I'm giving today. Um, and you can see a ton of them there. I'd like to talk for a few minutes about Type 1 Grit. Type 1 Grit's a community of committed Bernstein followers. We gather via a private Facebook group that was founded in April of 2014. I discovered the group in November of 2015 when it had just over 1,000 members. Today, Type 1 Grid has over 3,200 members, and they're split about evenly between parents of children and adults with type 1 diabetes. The group is an excellent example of what's possible. I wanted to talk about what Type 1 Grit meant to my family, and I'm gonna do that now, but I, I put the before and after on the backdrop of Andrew's A1Cs, because frankly, A1C wasn't a, wasn't a metric that really moved for us, but here's the kind of things that mattered for my family. Prior to finding type 1 grit, we knew no one else in the world that followed Dr. Bernstein's regimen. So for five and a half years, it was me and my wife and Dr. Bernstein's book, and that literally was it. All the type 1 diabetic children that Andrew had ever met ate more freely and were comparatively poorly managed. All new food and recipe experiments happened on an N equals 1 scale. Food discoveries were limited to our own efforts or to happenstance. And care decisions had only Ellen and me for brainstorming. After finding type 1 grit, I routinely interact with hundreds of Bernstein followers. My son now knows many well-controlled type 1 diabetic children and adolescents, and I now know several people that have followed Dr. Bernstein's regimen for several decades. I'm going to introduce you to a few in a couple minutes. Public service announcements, recipes, tips and tricks, they just flow through the group and they're a huge blessing. And the Revere Foundation now exists. I've had the unique privilege of attending grit togethers. I've attended many of them, but I've attended them in three states. Pictured here are Florida, Georgia, and Texas. Uh, at the Florida and Georgia events, I had the foresight to take some photographs of food. Uh, the three along the top are uh, a, a gathering at my house in Florida. The bottom is a gathering at a friend's house in Georgia. Their young son, Grant, is to the right of the slide. 
he is getting ready to partake in a very large plate of low carbohydrate desserts that I know were very easy on Grant's blood sugar. I'd now like to take a few minutes to introduce you to some senior citizen type 1 gritters. I'm going to start with Mr. Jamie Sharples. Jamie is 66 years old and lives in Chinook, Montana. He found Dr. Bernstein's first book in 1981, only two months after it was published. And he's followed Dr. Bernstein's regimen for 38 years. In April of this year, Jamie posted a one sentence post to type 1 grit that really struck me. I'm going to read it to you. I spent 47 years now hearing about the cure but I thank God for my 38 years of living in the solution. Jamie took a picture of his book that he bought in 1981 and posted it as a comment to somebody else's post and I copied that there. I'm not gonna read it for the sake of time. This is slide 71. Uh, Mr. Sharples uh, also in September of 16 introduced himself to the group. That's when he first joined. At that time he was 63 years old. He was diagnosed in May of 1973 and talks about how for the first eight years of his type 1 diabetes, he daily thought that he was going to die. He spent many sentences describing finding Dr. Bernstein's regimen and converting over. I had to redact those. He ended by saying that he has nine children and that one of his daughters had been recently diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. The photograph to the left there is Jamie, his wife, and their nine children. The photograph to the right is Jamie and his daughter Promise, who was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes uh, in 2016. This is Ms. Amy Fields Perrin. She's 65 years old. Actually, she turns 65 next week. She lives in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. She was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in 1971 at the age of 16. She sent me this bulleted list, and if you'll bear with me, I'd like to just read it to you. These are her words. By 42 years old, I was sick and desperate. I had frozen shoulders, frozen hips, stiff person syndrome, fatigue, and depression. A diabetic friend sent, sent a Dr. Bernstein article about frozen shoulder and its relationship to high blood sugar. At the end of the article was an offer for two cassette tapes that explained his method. Those arrived on June 2nd of 1996. My husband and I listened to those tapes the next day, and I switched to five shots a day from a one-shot-a-day regiment and to a very low-carbohydrate diet. Right away, my depression and fatigue lifted. Over the next few months, all other complications lifted. I'm happy and healthy. My husband and I exercise. We walk six to seven miles each day. We have three grown children and five grandchildren. I'm eternally grateful to Dr. Bernstein for saving my life. This is Ms. Juanita Hansen. She's 66 years old and lives in Lincoln, Nebraska. These are also her words that she emailed me. Bear with me, I'm just going to read them to you. I've had type 1 diabetes for 45 years, since the age of 21. About six years ago at age 60, after being quite sick for many years, I began a journey to restore my health. My motivation was marrying my husband, Ron, picture to the right there. I suffered from poorly controlled type 1 diabetes, painful neuropathy, gastroparesis, depression, and anxiety. On my own, I lowered my A1C from 9 to 6. But to achieve that, I wasn't able to eat much. On social media, I heard of A1C values in the fives for the very first time and the suggestion to read Dr. Bernstein's Diabetes Solution. I read Dr. Bernstein's book. I followed his protocol to the best of my ability. I also moved from an insulin pump to multiple daily injections of insulin. My A1C is between 4.9 and 5.5 for the last two and a half years. I no longer have symptoms of gastroparesis, neuropathy, depression, or anxiety, and I take far fewer medications. My type 1 diabetic brother, Dale, was 27 when he died. He was blind with gastroparesis and kidney failure. I was diagnosed that same year, and I want to help others in memory of Dale. So now I'm going to present some recent research on Dr. Bernstein's management regimen. Uh, the Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School studied a group of us out of type 1 grit. My son participated in the study. Those results were published in uh, the June 2018 edition of the Journal of Pediatrics. Uh, some of the results were the average A1C from the study group was 5.67%. You can see the distribution chart there on the right. The average daily carbohydrate intake was 36 grams. The group showed a very low average total daily insulin intake of only four-tenths of a unit per kilogram of body weight. The group also showed a remarkably low one-to-one -one ratio of triglycerides to HDL cholesterol. The two, the two leading risk factors for heart disease and diabetes 
is A1C and triglycerides. Ms. Belinda Lenners, who is a lead study author, was quoted as saying, their blood sugar control seemed almost too good to be true. It's nothing that we typically see in the clinic for type 1 diabetes. I showed you guys this chart several slides ago. I've added to the chart right in the center the results of the type 1 GRIT study, the average result from the Boston Children's and Harvard Medical School study of type 1 GRIT. The same day those study results were published, Anna Hot O'Connor published this article in the New York Times. I'm showing it to you for two reasons. We'll start with the proud dad moment down at the bottom. Uh, Andrew was interviewed by Anna Hod and he was quoted as saying, I do this so that I can be healthy. When I eventually move out and go to college, I'm going to keep up what I'm doing because I'm on the right path. I circle to the top right of this slide, there's 255 user comments on the New York Times website on this article. Among those 255 comments are some of the best testimonials that I've ever read. So if you want some more testimonials, you can see some right there on the New York Times. This is slide 80, the link's at the bottom. So I don't have a lot of time, I have a lot of material. Um, so I'm gonna breeze through some meal details, examples of the types of low carb foods uh, that my family eats, starting with breakfast. So these are two random days I plucked out of November of 2018. You can see on one day, Andrew ate one-fourth of a taco quiche made in a nine-inch round baking dish. On the other day, he ate a four-egg omelet with bacon, ham, and cheese. You see other things on here like a Walmart patty sausage, diabetic-friendly, very low-carb yogurt, uh, an ounce of chopped pecans, and two tablespoons of diced blueberries and strawberries along with that yogurt. These are very typical school day lunches, not only for Andrew, but my daughter eats these exact same types of foods. On both days, he had a sandwich on a rustic faux wheat, bed, wheat bread, which is a very low carb recipe I'm gonna share with you a little later. Um, one day, that sandwich was a steak and cheese with mayonnaise, and the other day was peanut butter with a very low carb Walden's Farm jelly. Uh, he also ate yogurts on both these days. You see other things like pumpkin seeds, red grapes, a bag of Quest protein chips, those are photo, uh, pictured at the bottom right there, and pumpkin seeds. Typical dinners for my family are actually uh, very standard. Uh, T-bone steak was one night here, pork chop was another night. You'll see vegetables that you'll recognize like steamed broccoli, yellow squash, coleslaw, pan-fried okra. You'll also notice that on both nights, as is typical in my home, we were served desserts by my wonderful wife. Uh, one night that was low carb Boston poke cake, which is divine by the way. It's like a, a Boston cream donut and a cake. It's wonderful. Um, the other night was a low carb New York, child, New York style cheesecake with diced blueberries and strawberries and sugar free chocolate syrup. And only because I had empty space on this slide and that is a pet peeve of mine, I threw in a lemon blueberry cake and a Kentucky butter cake with pecan halves on it they're both divine as well. So let's talk about daily macronutrients and calories a little bit. So if you take those last three slides and you add up the left hand and right hand column, breakfast, lunches, and dinner total up this way. You see 30 grams of carbs, we talked about that already. Uh, one day he ate 285 grams of protein, the other day he ate 231 grams of protein. One day was 3,228 calories, the other day was 2,677 calories, so notice these days exhibit some variability. Absolute rigidity is not required, but all of these meals were consistent with our low carb and high protein meal plan. So now I'd like to give some food related tips and tricks, and I'll start by saying that hidden sugars are literally everywhere, and particularly in processed foods. So you can't just look at nutri nutrition labels, you also have to carefully review ingredients lists, and you're looking for things like maltodextrin, which is in a lot of sugar-free products, and the FDA shouldn't allow it, but they do. Maltodextrin is rapidly digested to glucose and will spike blood sugar. You gotta look out for things like mannitol, sorbitol, sucrose, xylose, lactose, and the list goes on and on and on. It's worth buying Dr. Bernstein's book, if for no reason than the giant lists of these things that he has in there. Natural sweeteners like honey, molasses, corn syrup, et cetera, will rapidly spike blood sugar. In short, you gotta read labels and you have to look out for ingredients, not just carb counts. And really, you gotta let your blood sugar results guide your future decisions much more than any nutrition label. Eating at restaurants is not difficult, but there are some landmines. For example, 
It is common for pancake batter to be added to scrambled eggs and omelets. I gave a recent example, I photographed it here, of an IHOP experience. So I know this fact, and so I know to ask for shelled eggs at IHOP, and you can see that actually shows up on my ticket. If you don't ask for shelled eggs, your omelet will be made with a pre-mixed scrambled egg mixture that includes pancake batter for fluffiness, and that will spike the diabetic blood sugar. Uh, it is common for chicken to be sugar brined. A lot of barbecue is brown sugar coated, so you have to ask. Uh, many salad dressings have added sugar. Uh, soups and bisques are often loaded up with rice or wheat flour. Diet sodas are not trustworthy in a restaurant environment. Really, I just like to stick with meat and vegetables at barbecue or steak places or breakfast foods, which I love, or simple salads with meat added and blue cheese dressing, which is my preference, or ranch dressing, which is Andrew's preference. This is an example of hacking a McDonald's triple cheeseburger. Um, you can see there we bought a triple cheeseburger and we dumped it out of its bun onto a low carb smart bun. This sandwich is very easy to dump because it's three pieces of meat with two pieces of cheese stuck in between the meat. So it dumps out very easily. When you dump it into a low carb smart bun and add a bag of Quest protein chips, you get a meal with 572 calories, 57 grams of protein, and only 12 grams of carbohydrate. Very consistent with my son's meal plan. So I mentioned earlier my children eat sandwiches most days on low-carb breads. These are the two staple recipes that Ellen uses to make those breads. I'll just point out that prior to finding type 1 grit, we rarely fiddle with this stuff. Um, but since finding type 1 grit and learning of these recipes and how good they frankly are, how much my children like them, uh, my children now eat sandwiches on most days. So I'm going to make a few recipe and cookbook recommendations, starting with Miss Vicki DePier. Uh, Vicki's book is entitled The Low Carb Solution for Diabetics. Vicki's from South Africa. Her son was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes when he was in the third grade. Vicki transitioned her family to low carbohydrate, Dr. Bernstein's regimen, just like I did. Uh, and this is her, her book, and there's some links to it. This is slide 91. Uh, Ms. Maria Emmerich of Maria Mind, Body, and Health also has tremendous uh, uh, information for low carb dieting. She has a great online website, online blog, and she has a recipe. Uh, many recipe books, sorry, that you can buy at all bookstores and Amazon.com. She also has the dubious distinction of having my favorite chocolate cake in the world, uh, which I also put on here as a second bullet point. This is slide 92. Uh, Miss Carolyn Ketchum runs the food blog all day I dream about food. And likewise, she has great online recipes. Carolyn has a number of cookbooks that are staples in my wife's kitchen. So I'd like to take a few minutes to introduce you to the Revere Foundation, which I'm a board member of, and we do business under the brand Let Me Be 83. So our mission is to promote a diabetes management regimen anchored in nutrition and the proper use of insulin that allows people with diabetes to achieve near to normal blood sugar. Our goals are to inform patients of the choice and to change the standards of care that make success nearly impossible. So I love Warren Buffett. I'm trained as an economist. I told you earlier in this talk that I have an economics degree from Florida State. Um, Warren Buffett's my second favorite economist behind Peter Drucker, but Warren Buffett has better quotes. Um, so these two quotes really resonate with me about why I'm involved with the Revere Foundation. So Warren says, if you're in the luckiest 1% of humanity, you owe it to the rest of humanity to think about the other 99%. He also says, if you find yourself in a chronically leaky boat, energy devoted to changing vessels is likely more productive than energy devoted to patching leaks. Unfortunately, Warren also says that people will always try to stop you from doing the right thing if it is unconventional. And he's right about this. And unfortunately for our community, this is conventional. Dietary advice that my teen son needs a minimum of 225 grams of dietary carbohydrate a day. He hasn't eaten 5% of that in nine years. He's nearly six feet tall. Neither Andrew nor I have eaten an ear of corn or a plate of pasta in nine years. And don't forget, 
The Institute of Medicine's Dietary Reference Intakes Manual says the lower limit of dietary carbohydrate compatible with life is zero, provided that adequate amount of protein and fat are consumed. So does the conventional high carb advice that we are all given, does it make any sense? It, it doesn't to me. So in short, the Revere Foundation exists because well-controlled diabetes is the leading cause of nothing. And the prevailing outcomes are just not well-controlled. There's a lot of resources available at letmebea3.org, things like recipes, links to recipe, blogs, products that we recommend such as snack foods, cooking supplies. There's an online store where you can buy some of the books I've recommended to you today. There's swag like shirts, caps, coffee mugs. Uh, there's blood sugar journals, there's shopping lists to take you to the, take you to the grocery store to get you started. Uh, there's a success kit that we put together um, that's a great gift for beginners. There's a lot of infographics on the website. You've seen several of them in my slide deck today. Um, we have links to pertinent Diabetes University on YouTube videos. These are, these are videos that uh, Dr. Bernstein and Dr. R.D. Dykeman have put together together uh, starting in 2015. There are so many hours of content in Diabetes University on YouTube that is basically the content of his book put into YouTube videos. And we link to a lot of those that are pertinent uh, on that website. There's fundraising information. The foundation is a registered 501c3 public charity and we would really appreciate any support that any, any of you would like to give us. There's event information. Uh, we hold events from time to time through the year. The foundation is also working on a documentary film. Uh, it is not yet finished. When it is finished, it will be a full feature length film. Uh, we have released, however, a 22 minute short film. Uh, we did that earlier this year. This is slide 103. The link to that video is at the bottom of the slide. I'd invite you to, uh, to have a look at it when you have a chance. I'd like to close with what I'd consider to be some lost wisdom of the past. These words were written by Dr. Elliot Jocelyn. They were published in June of 1923 in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Dr. Jocelyn is the founder of the Jocelyn Diabetes Center. Before I read his quote, 1923 was the year after insulin became readily available in 1922. Dr. Jocelyn said, successful treatment of diabetes with insulin depends on the utilization of all those measures that have proved of the greatest value in the treatment of diabetes without insulin. These are adherence to a diet which will keep the urine sugar free avoidance of overnutrition or extreme undernutrition, and a method of life compatible with the strength that such a diet affords. Insulin does not cure diabetes. Insulin does not allow a diabetic to eat anything he desires. It is cruel for prominent individuals to make such statements and arouse false hope. It is true that heretofore there has never been anything discovered as valuable for the diabetic as insulin, but diabetes, though subdued, is not yet conquered. I'd like to leave you with a quote that I love from Vince Lombardi. He says, perfection is not attainable, but if we chase perfection, we can catch excellence. I really hope that in my presentation today, I've demonstrated to you that there's a lot of excellence catching happening in our community, but it's far too rare. My heart's deepest desire is that my talk has been helpful, that it's inspiring, that it may draw an interest in you to research this. Thank you for listening.